Hey everyone, welcome back as we now move into chapter 5 of Revelation, the continuation of John's hearing and seeing what takes place in the very presence of the throne room of God Almighty. Let's open with a prayer and we'll jump right into the text. Gracious God, the one who opened the mysteries of this life and the life to come, the one who grants love to all people, the one who holds us to account for our falling away from you and from our love for each other, and the one and the only one who has the power to redeem us from our own sinfulness and our own mistakes. Grant that our hearts may be opened as we hear this word, that your word may fill us, nourish us, and empower us to find strength in our weakness and to proclaim love in the midst of a world that truly needs to hear this message. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, so again, let's jump right into the text here. We are covering chapter 5 today, so follow along on your screen or open your Bible and your app. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor, and glory, and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down, and worshipped. All right, so as we did yesterday, I'm going to throw up a little scroll of some art. This probably each one's just going to last a few seconds, but I invite you to pause, look at each one, draw out your own vision from this, use those to help in your own mind take a vision of this text that you just heard, and then come back and let's proceed on the video.
So now that you've looked at the artwork, let's dive right into the text today. I want to pick up where I left off yesterday. I said it was going to talk a little bit more about worship. The context of Revelation, once again, is about worship. And here is a wonderful thing in the book of Revelation of, as I will go as we go through the text, you'll see the world, the creation being pulled in to this scene that takes place in heaven. A very powerful scene, considering that what we'll see uh, the next time we gather for chapter 6, which will be tomorrow's lesson, will be the opening of the seals of the scroll, which is also the coming of doom upon the people of the earth. We'll have a lot more to say about that when we get to it. So diving right into the text, though, we immediately see that there is worship continuing, but there's a pause in the worship as John has seen the four living creatures proclaiming the holy, holy, holy that comes out of Isaiah 6, or is where John was inspired with that uh, proclamation and doxology to God, and then the 24 elders bowing down, casting their crowns in front of the one who's deserving of all praise. Then it's like John looks and notices something for the first time. He's overwhelmed with these images, but he zeroes in on one thing in particular. Verse 1 of today, I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. This is another image that comes out of Ezekiel and it's out of some other apocalyptic literature, but Ezekiel is most notable a scroll written on the inside and out, that Ezekiel is asked to eat at one point in the lesson. And we're going to see that happen to John 2 as we go forward. Uh, I think it's chapter 10, but a few lessons from now. Here is this scroll written on front and back, a scroll which John, being the one commanded to write these visions and these things that he is seeing down in a book, the testimony of the word, which of course is a living word, the word expressed through Jesus, but the word is also about the written and spoken word, the testimony and the witnessing that comes through offering oral and written uh, notes and witness to the power of Jesus. And here it says it's sealed with seven seals. A seal is much like a signature when we sign our signature on a bank document. You, you've made your commitment to what you sign on that, whether you like it or not. The seal functioned in very much the same way. We may know from history that kings would have signet rings. That would be the signet or the signature of the king from that seal that would be imprinted upon a parchment that would then be sent out as a proclamation to the people or as a royal decree to sent to another kingdom or to another um, place where the king's message needed to be shared. Sealed with seven seals. The number seven again comes up. Everything that is needed to be said is included within that seven seal. God, the one seated on the throne, has sealed it and has sworn, just like when we sign a document today, that everything in it he is bound to follow and to fulfill. And what's in this? Well, that's the great mystery, and that's what is perplexing John. And while, yes, we know what's going to come out, so to speak, of this document, uh, when it's opened in later chapters, it is meant to lead us as the hearer into suspense, which I think is very important for us to be suspended in this and to witness, no pun intended, John's marveling at this because it is, here is the future of God's people stored in the hands of the one seated on the throne. One of the art pieces you saw, there was a mighty angel, that vision of the mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seal? No one, according to verse 3. No one in heaven or on earth and under the earth. 
And John begins to weep over this. He weeps bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Why does John weep? It's not a, he shouldn't assume the answer to this. We think, oh, nobody's there. And just sort of this assume of John's ignorance. But John's not ignorant in this. John, as we're going to see through these passages today and coming up, John is now a full and active participant in this divine audience that stands in front of the throne. John is seeing and hearing things that are making him a part of this party. It's more likely that instead of, woe is us because there's no one who can open this, it's rather that it's John eagerly awaiting and becoming impatient with the fact that God's ultimate judgment and redemption of those who have patiently endured and those who are conquering through their patient endurance, that there is yet a further delay in that coming to fruition. If you think of the context of John's church, that would be a more likely explanation, a church that is stuck in that place between professing their allegiance to Rome, which would have taken all the persecution off of them, but would have destroyed the integrity of their faith, versus proclaiming Jesus as Lord, which puts them at constant risk of physical pain and even death. Why are you waiting is almost why John's tears are coming. This needs to happen. We are so ready for this to come to fruition. Then he gets an answer. Verse 5, then one of the elders, presumably one of the 24 that we saw in the last chapter, said to me, do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. But stop with that image for just a second. Don't jump ahead just yet. A couple of very important things in this image. The command, do not weep. Your, your sorrow, your grief, God is about to comfort you. There is a pastoral message that we just sort of gloss over when we hear that phrase, don't weep. Like, what are you crying about? You know, sort of like what we do to kids sometimes when they get upset over silly things. And I, I, I don't think everybody reads it that way, but there is a strong tendency just to, now, now, John, you know, we got this all figured out. No, it's a pastoral statement. Do not weep. For here is what's about to happen. See, the command to see should not be overlooked. Here is John in heaven hearing and seeing these divine mysteries. And whenever it particularly is given a command for him to hear or see something really important is about to happen. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The root of David, that first expression, is, is actually a phrase that in particular comes out of Isaiah 11, a reading that comes up in our Advent lesson. It is talking about one who will spring up from Jesse, a root of David, who will come and shepherd my people. Of course, we know it's referring to Jesus, and John's readers know it's referring to Jesus. It's not, it's not a mystery in that sense who it's referring to. The lion of the tribe of Judah, a little bit more complex image there. Uh, if you go back to the blessings that Jacob, in the patriarch Jacob in Genesis, offers to his sons, one of his sons is named Judah, which is the tribe that Jesus uh, comes from in his earthly origin. One of the blessings given to Judah is that they will be a lion among his brothers, is that he will be a lion among his brothers, and that he will be able uh, to show his power and majesty among the nations. And I can't remember the exact blessing. But you can go back and look in Genesis to the blessings Jacob gives to his sons. And in those blessings, it is apparent that Judah is the one who stands out. And of course, Christians can read back into it. It was a prophecy of Jesus. But there's some other places where this image of the lion comes from. And it's also this image of the lion here from Genesis, especially from here in Revelation. If you ever read the Narnia series that C.S. Lewis uh, uh, famously wrote, it's wonderful fantasy, but grounded in scriptural images. Aslan, the great king, is represented as a lion, and that's exactly where that image comes from, from here in this verse. 
See the lion of the tribe of Jada, the root of da the lion can't speak. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Just like the saints are conquering, he has conquered as an example for the saints. Not only as an example, but because he has conquered, he now has the authority to open the scroll and its seven seals. In other words, he is the only one vested with the ability to open the seals that God himself has put upon this scroll. So don't gloss over this image. Very important detailed words that are in here, especially when we now look at verse 6. Then I saw, command to see, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Stop. In the midst, the, the verb literally means in the middle of, like not just kind of hanging out in a position between, but almost like there's a physical space carved out in the middle of the throne, which the verb itself from a literal sense doesn't make any sense because like the lamb just sort of comes out of the throne. It's a verb that is meant to express the fact that it is the one who, just like the throne is in the center, the lamb also with the throne is centered in the midst of this heavenly court. Very, very clear and intentional Trinitarian image and with the connection to the seven spirits of God, these seven angels, the spirit of God, both represented both and here by angels and by the spirit of God that goes out and sees all the earth. But perhaps even more notable than those powerful images. Look, here's the lion. But what he's actually seen, he's told it's going to be a lion. But what he actually sees is a lamb. A lamb that's standing as if it had been slaughtered. You saw one of those images in the artwork that I posted up at the beginning of this video. Yes, it's incongruous. See here, ah, a lion. That's not a lion, that's a lamb. It is meant to be an evocative image that does not correlate with what went on before. It is meant also to say that the revelation of the lion, the one who comes in might and power to save the people, is also represented an image, and God, the word that one of our commentators, or one of the commentators that I'm using says, is God has identified himself to the world in the form of this lamb. We'll have more to say about this in some lessons coming up, but what I want to say at the meantime is the lamb is not a passive victim. Lamb is not one who just sort of, okay, I'll just lay down and let them do whatever. The lamb was an active witness of endurance, patient suffering, and conquering that was able to defeat the powers of death and evil through standing up and not allowing death to be the final word. I said there's a lot more to it than that. It is powerful in the sense that the power of God made manifest in the weakness of the cross, is represented in one who comes in a form that not only is non-threatening, but really in many ways is almost a parody of one who comes in power. In fact, the word lamb, and we're so used as Christians to hearing the word lamb because we talk about the lamb, the Passover sacrifice, which is where that origin comes from. In John's gospel, Jesus refers to himself often, or is referred by John the Baptist in a few cases as the Lamb of God. We see this image all over the language of the church over the years. The difference with this word is this word, it's a little slightly different form of the Greek word for lamb. This word is almost like little bitty lamb, like you would say a, 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 you know, a, a youngster or a kiddo or something like that instead of saying a child. You're, you're making an exaggeration. Oh, just a, look at a cute little fellow over there. Oh, look at this cute little lamb. That's a rough analogy, but that's what that word comes across. So it's not so much cute. It's just this, oh, yeah, look at this little thing over here. That's the image that that word in Greek conveys. And yet, seven horns, which that's significant for when we see the beast later on, 
who also possesses horns, seven eyes, which represent again the seven spirits of God. But do not try to reconcile. Here's a lion, here's a lamb, they must be united together because their images are meant to be separate and yet refer to the same person that we know as Jesus. So, verse 7. The Lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. He didn't ask for permission. He just went as if this was what was always meant to be. I don't think that's an accidental or reading too much into it. There's no, may I, may you not orphan Annie, may I please, sir, have the scroll? It is, he just goes and takes it out of the might, hand of the mighty figure seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures of the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Don't gloss over that either. In our church, we have a belief, and we're probably not as strong in the Episcopal Church with this as, say, the Roman Catholic, the Orthodox traditions are. But still in the Episcopal Church, we believe that when we pray, there is intercession being made for us in heaven. Some people would argue it's through the saints, but at the very least, it's in the presence of the Lamb that here are those who were making intercession on behalf of those who were still going through the trials and the patient endurance on earth. So here are all these prayers being lifted up in the midst of these witness of these prayers being lifted into the heavenly throne room. Those prayers are being thrown as well and cast at the feet of the Lamb and of the throne as both a witness to and a thanksgiving for the resolution and the final answer, so to speak, that's about to come. But we go with worship. Here we are in worship once again. They fall down. Sort of a usual theme when, when uh, an angel or God himself appears in front of someone you either back up, you cover your face, or you bow down, not because necessarily that's you, it's just the automatic response, but rather when you are in front of something that's that awesome and powerful, that is, you know, in many ways, what our natural reaction would be to something like that. And they sing a new song. The word new comes up a lot in Revelation. There's a lot of new things that are proclaimed as this revelation, one revelation, continues to be revealed piece by piece. You are worthy, O Lamb, to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Here is going back to worship. Worship is not just about us getting what we want from God. In fact, that's very little of what worship's about. Worship is about us drawing deeper in our relationship with God. Worship is also realizing that we are part of this kingdom of God on earth. And worship in many ways reminds us of both our identity as those who are the called of God and of our destiny to be those who rule with God on earth. And that brings up an important point when we talk about the word conquer, which we've seen a few times now in the text. The word conquer always implies a military victory of some sort. Nowhere in Revelation does conquer imply defeat. Now, yes, there's a lot of killing that goes on in Revelation, but conquering and the plagues and all the doomsday things that happen are often separate. Conquering is often referred to those who stand their ground, again, patiently endure, who hold fast to the teaching of the church, who hold fast to their faith in God, and from that they conquer. Worshiping gives us the power to be conquered. To be conquerors, not as those who go out with military might to slay the heathen, but as those who can withstand the assaults and temptations of the world and maintain the purity of our faith, a hugely important theme for Revelation. Four living creatures and the 24 elders respond in worship here to 
the lamb taking the scroll. But then in verse 11, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So now the entire legion of heavenly hosts, more than can be counted, are standing around the throne. Again, imagine the image of just thousands of these angelic beings and how overwhelming a vision that might be for John. And yet he's able to say this myriad of angels who then proclaim another doxology to God. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. In other words, to receive all of these things that in their worldly forms are often distortions. When we think of power, oftentimes people that we know with power in this world use that power for their own good and to manipulate and control others and to harm others when their own interests are threatened. Wealth, the same way. Wisdom, how you know we like to prop up that we might be smarter than everyone else. Mights, let's say power, honor, and glory, and blessing. All of those things are attributes that in later in Revelation are things that are distorted within the realm of Babylon. You'll hear a lot more about that. But in the earthly, fallen earthly kingdom that's represented by Babylon, which is a thinly veiled reference, Rome of that day, all of those features have been distorted by how Babylon has used them. Here in heaven, the lamb, because of his slaughter, at the power of those who have abused and manipulated and controlled not only the destinies of others, but even trying to set themselves in the place of God. The lamb through that slaughter and overcoming those powers has now achieved true power, the true wealth of riches found in the grace of God, true wisdom and might and the honor, glory and blessing that is before John here in this heavenly throne room. Then the inclusive vision expands out even more in verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. And almost there's an insinuation that this process continues to repeat and go forth and go forth and go forth. I mentioned yesterday that sometimes we think of worship is it's just about, you know, here in the heavenly realm, it's just about, ah, we're just bowing down and doing this singing and dancing a lot. Where's the fun in that? If you dig between beneath the words enough here in Revelation, you realize that what is happening here is a victory celebration. The power of evil has been shattered. The goodness of God in providing true and great gifts to the people of God has now come to fruition. And it expands ultimately that every person in heaven, on earth, under the earth, everything that God has created, will join in this. And in many ways, an ironic statement, considering many people view Revelation as, well, the people who were good, God's going to save the people who were bad. God's going to smite them in very numerous and creative ways. But truth be told, Revelation has always been viewed as a book that expresses, perhaps more than any other book in the New Testament, a sense of God's universal salvation. And very fitting that we have that backdrop as we go into tomorrow's reading, which is where the seals are opened and these great and terrible things emerge at the breaking of each seal. When we hear those words spoken in the context of this image of victory and celebration and worship of what God is, what God has done, and what God continues to do, and be for the people who patiently endure and conquer, then we can put these doomsday devices a little bit more in their context. In a couple of days, a couple of these videos from now, I'm going to talk specifically about the violence that we see in Revelation and, and talk about the theology behind that. 
For now, I want you, as we prepare for reading chapter 6 tomorrow, I want you simply to dwell today on the awesome sights and those words in particular here. See the lion, the lamb, the one who was worthy because he was slaughtered and the celebration of all these people gathering together to come into the very presence of the one who gives life to all things. That's a great play today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for chapter 6. Here in God. Bless.